Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. title of my message this morning is A Faithful Servant from the first six verses of Hebrews chapter 3. We return to the book of Hebrews and a couple of weeks ago we completed chapter 2. The author discussed Jesus being superior to the angels in the first chapter. And then in chapter 2 the author addressed that at the same time, excuse me, Jesus is superior to the angels he became oh, I got the hiccups now. A little lower than the angels when he became a man. So now in chapter three, the author compares Jesus to Moses, one of the greatest, most significant characters in Jewish history. So let's dig into our text of chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, beginning in chapter, or in verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus... I don't need water, I've got my coffee, thank you. Who needs water when you got coffee? <laughs> Therefore, holy brothers, you share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. Again, this chapter begins with a link to the previous passage. Jesus is God's Son, is very God Himself, superior to the angels, but at the same time still a man, who was the propitiation or satisfaction of the legal requirements for God to forgive us. So we should consider Jesus the Apostle and High Priest of our Confession. There's just so much to unpack in this, uh, in this verse. First, notice that the author refers to his readers as holy brothers. I think the use of holy and brothers indicates the author is, is writing to Jewish Christians. I think those two words in combination, it's kind of a, a rare combination in Scripture, but those two specific words tell us something about who he's writing, who he is and who he's writing to. They were ethnically his brothers, but they also had been set apart by God, called to be followers of Jesus. He referred to them as ones who shared in a heavenly calling. So the author of the book of Hebrews is, is writing to people that are in two ways related to him. They are ethnically Jews, but they are related to him by being part of the family of God, and so he uses the term Holy brothers. Holy re referring to the set apart being the, the church. Brothers being Jews. And I think that's what he means there. And he referred to them as ones who share in a heavenly calling. Here's your first question. What is the heavenly calling? Us being drawn to this to Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Us being drawn to the Holy Spirit or to Jesus by the Holy Spirit. The question that has to be answered is what does the author have in mind when he says heavenly calling? Is he thinking about the call that God made before the foundation of, of the earth to draw him draw us to him? Or is the author thinking about the call we have as followers of Jesus to make disciples, baptize, and teach Jesus, all that Jesus taught? Since he talks about our confession and compares Jesus to Moses, I would argue that he's thinking about sharing the gospel with others. Your heavenly calling is to do what Jesus told you to do. I would argue that he's thinking about sharing the gospel with others. His call to us to be light and salt in our, in our world. 
The author also calls Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. These titles demand a little bit of explanation. The word apostle is the Greek word apostolon. The English word apostle is simply a transliteration from Greek into English via Latin. We often see this word used to describe an early church office, the, the office of apostle, Peter and Paul and John and, and Bartholomew and so forth. They're, they held the office of apostle. We forget the word also has a much broader use in Greek. It's a word that has the meaning of delegate or messenger or ambassador or deputy. You know, for 27 years I was a deputy sheriff. My law enforcement authority came from the sheriff himself, not from the office. If you are a police officer, your authority comes from the city, not from the chief of police. But if you're a deputy sheriff, your authority comes from the sheriff. The sheriff, by law, is given the authority to be a law enforcer. Law enforcer. And he then deputizes us and gives us his authority. Different from a police officer. But in, in becoming a deputy sheriff, notice they're not deputy police chiefs. See the difference? As a deputy sheriff, I am representing, or I did represent the sheriff. When uh, we have a new president, we, we appoint new ambassadors. Those ambassadors have the authority to speak for the president, not for the country, for the president, the head of state for the United States. So they go to foreign countries and they speak on behalf of the president to the foreign countries. That is the idea of apostle. They carry the authority to act on the behalf of God. As used in this context, the word apostle indicates that Jesus was deputized by the Father to carry a message and mission to the world. Remember, Jesus is a revelation from God, just as Scripture is. Jesus himself, as we saw in chapter 1, is a revelation to the world of God. The Jewish recipients of this letter understood the function of of a high priest. In the Old Testament, the high priest served as the middleman between God and the people, and the people and God. You would go to the temple, and you would bring your sacrifice, and the priest would lay hands on it, and the priest would convey the sacrifice to be slaughtered, and would convey to you the atonement. But here in Hebrews, the author changes up the role just a little bit. I think combining apostle and high priest in one description he intends to say that Jesus, as apostle, represents God to the people, and as high priest, represents the people to God. Jesus is the middleman between us and the Father. The word confession is the Greek word homologeus. Don't think of confession as, uh, as I used to like to solicit. There was nothing more thrilling as a as an investigator, then, to get someone to confess to a crime. I always liked doing that. I was pretty good at it. But that's not exactly what we're talking about here. There is... The, the, think of homo legaeus in a more positive way. Think of it as an affirming what you believe. I'm not confessing to a crime I committed. I'm affirming in what I believe. Or in this case, if you believe in Jesus, you're affirming Jesus. Jesus is the one in whom we believe because he is God's representative to us and our representative to God. So, we go on in chapter 3, verse 2. Who was faithful to him, who appointed him, just as Moses was also faithful in all God's house. Jesus was faithful to the Father in accomplishing his mandate. God said to Jesus, this is what I want you to do. And Jesus went out and did that. In keeping with the author's tactic of comparing Jesus to others, he reflects the faithfulness 
of uh, Moses and as Jesus in comparison. We go back to the verse Chuck just read, Numbers 12, 7. Not so my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. The author of the book of Hebrews quotes from the book of Numbers to validate his claim about Jesus. As a book of the law, it was held in awe and even worshipped by the Jews of Jesus' day. So in claiming Jesus is like Moses, it carried some weight. Moses was the great liberator that brought them out of slavery in Egypt, provided to them the law. The law, the very law that the Jews then, at the time of Jesus, worshipped. And so to say that Jesus was just as, Mo, as faithful as Moses, that was a big, big statement. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. The author couldn't leave it that Jesus was faithful like Moses. The whole point of this section is Jesus' preeminence. So he had to go further. Jesus is not only faithful like Moses, but he's also been viewed as worthy of more than more, more glory than Moses. Moses was one of the most respected and revered Old Testament leaders. No one could ever be superior to him in the minds of the Jews. But Jesus is considered to be greater than the one of the greatest heroes. I love how the author validates that Jesus is superior to Moses. The builder gets all the praise and is superior to the building. Sure, the building or house can be really, really nice. But it, it's the skill and workmanship of the builder that makes it such. The building didn't just appear. Somebody made it. And so the, the maker of it gets the praise. The building actually contributes nothing to it except it looks good standing there afterwards. Now look how he finishes verse 4. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. I love how he does that. This is a declaration that God is superior to everything. Jesus is also God. Exalted here because Jesus is the representative of the Godhead. He walks in God's authority. Remember, he's been appointed deputy by God the Father to be his representative. He's been appointed apostle to be his representative to us. In him dwells the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form to represent God to us. And he's superior to everything else. This is a declaration that God is superior, or is superior to everything. Jesus as God is also superior to everything. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as son, and we are his house, if indeed we hold fast to our confidence and our boasting in our hope. The comparison of Jesus and Moses continues in these verses. Now, here's your next question, and I admit it's a little bit more complex. What two words in these verses indicate the comparison between Moses and Jesus? I'll read those verses again for you. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we're his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence in our boasting in our hope. What two words there represent a comparison. I was looking back in verse 2, just as. Okay. Just as Moses. But in, the, in verses 5 and 6, particularly in verse 5, okay. there are two words that the author uses as a comparison. Servant and son. Servant and son, exactly. 
Moses was a servant, but Jesus is a son. There's a big difference in status between servants and sons. As used by Jesus, sons denotes the authority of the Father given to Jesus. He has the authority as a son. That's the whole point of Jesus being the Son of God. Was he created by God? No, he's not a progeny of God. But he has the authority that the, the Jewish culture understood that the oldest son gets. The authority to take over for the Father. He's appointed as heir to the Father. Servant, in this verse, is not doulos, which is slave, most often translated as servant. The word used here is therapon. This word is never used in the New Testament in a secular sense as a reference to a normal servant. It is only used in a religious sense of a worship aid. Someone who leads you in worship of God. Chuck would be a therapon. That's going to be my new nickname for you, a therapon. A worship aid. Moses was faithful to God in leading the Hebrews in the wilderness to build and use the tabernacle where they could meet with God. Moses gave the people what God gave to him. He led the people in knowing and relating to God. Jesus as son had a much larger responsibility. Moses was faithful to building the tabernacle, the house of God. Jesus was faithful to the Father in building his own house, the church. The church is not a physical building, but the people who collectively are Jesus' house. Now look closely at verse 6 again. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting, our boasting in our hope. We've got to be careful of how we interpret what's being said here. I don't think the author intends for us to understand that we could lose our salvation and no longer be part of the house of God if we don't hold fast to our confidence in God. If you stopped believing in God, I don't believe the author here is saying that you become unsaved. Although there are some that try to make this verse say that. We have too many other passages in Scripture that tell us that God hangs on to us and nothing can rip us out of His hands. The conditional structure of verse 6 indicated by the if parallels the, the, the parable of the soils in Mark 4. Let's go over to Mark 4, chapter, chapter 4, verse 3, and, and review this parable. Chapter, Mark chapter 4, verse 3, listen. Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil and immediately sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was uh, scorched and, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it and yielded no grain. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain growing up and increasing and yielding 30-fold, 60-fold and 100-fold. Jesus ex explains the par parable in a, in a few verses after that, so jump over to verse 13. Or, and he said to him, he who has ears, let him hear. Now over to verse 13. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. And these are the ones along the path. Who, where the word is sown, when they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the, the word that was sown in them. And these are the ones sown in the rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation, persecution arises on account of the world, or on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And the others are the ones sown among thorns. They are, they are those who hear the word, but 
The cares of the world have the deceitfulness of riches and desires of the things enter in and choke the word and proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word, accept it, bear fruit, 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. Our focus is on the seeds that fall on the rocky soil. They receive the word, but didn't take any root. When something comes along, they're off onto another path. The seeds do not represent anyone who is saved. They accept what's being said, but don't accept Jesus. They don't follow Jesus. They don't become true followers. They have no root. They may attend church for a while. They may even be involved, but they never truly trusted God. So go back to verse 6 of Hebrews chapter 3. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and boasting in our hope. In the same way, we are the house of God if we do not fall away. Just as the seeds on rocky ground do not produce followers of Jesus, only people who demonstrate faithfulness to Jesus are true followers of Jesus. Hear me plainly here. Not because they are faithful. They are not saved because they are faithful. They are faithful because they are saved. That order is, is important. They don't become faithful to get saved. They become faithful because they are saved. Because there has been a change in them. <coughs> Salvation is always a gift from God. Never something we do. So when the author of the book of Hebrews says we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope, he means the house is made up of the faithful. He's not saying that truly saved people are removed from the house of God. There, is, there are so many other passages that would, that would uh, be in conflict with that. That can't be the way we understand this. We are made into the house of God by Jesus. If we truly trust Him, we will be faithful to Him. The author of the book of Hebrews continues his discussion on Jesus' authority. Remember, it appears that he was writing to Hebrews because they were beginning to see Jesus as less than divine Messiah. He actually is. Gnosticism was a false teaching that crept into the church early, early, early in the time of the early church. If the intended audience of the book of Hebrews was actually the church in Jerusalem, the flagship of the church at this point, where the church began, if the, if the church in Jerusalem was actually in the grasp of false teachers... The book of Hebrews becomes even more important than we think it is. It's, in report, it's important to remind the readers that Jesus, the Son of God, very God Himself, was also a man who was the propitiation for us. Jesus satisfied the legal requirements of God's justice and holiness demanded. Jesus, God Himself, Man himself satisfied God the Father's legal requirements. I understand how Jews could find that difficult. Hear, O Israel, our God, he is one. How can God be in heaven and God be here with us? I understand how they would reject that. And then as they came to faith in Jesus, there were those that were pushing them away from seeing Jesus as divine. The same thing happens today. There are a number of, develop, uh, of denominations and fellowships that skirt that, that don't really want to say Jesus is very God himself. One of the fastest growing denominations in, uh, in uh, North America is Mormonism. Jesus is a created being, the brother of Satan. Jehovah's Witness, Jesus is a created being. Removing the divinity, just like the author of the book of Hebrews is talking to the very foundational church. 
It's important for the author to continue to rebuild the truth of who Jesus is. That he's preeminent to everybody, while at the same time, subservient or lower than the angels. God of the angels, lower than the angels, in order to pay the penalty that we created. It's equally important for us to know that truth as it is for the Hebrews to know it. Thank you, Father, for the truth you give us. Thank you for showing us who you are and what you, what you have taught us. For showing us in your word everything that you do and everything that you are. Thank you that Jesus paid the price for us, paid the penalty for our sins, and called us to be yours. Thank you, Father. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.